Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Afghanistan a critical state, nearly two years passed since US troop withdrawal. Anti-Pakistan protests erupt across the globe as Balochistan stands against Pakistan's nuke weapons. And yet another Kashmiri Hindu falls victim to Pak sponsor terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. It has been nearly two years since the U.S. withdrew its troops from Afghanistan. The country has been in utter chaos since the U.S. withdrawal and a forceful Taliban takeover. Afghanistan has been left in the lurch. The country is witnessing unimaginable proportions of humanitarian crisis under Taliban rule. They have no food, economy has taken a downturn, women in the country are barred from working at offices and several other issues of concern. Was America responsible for the disaster in Afghanistan? Is China's growing influence in the Afghan nation a concern for the South Asia? To find some answers, let's see this report. A hasty US withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021 sparked a flurry of questions that still remains unanswered. Was Afghanistan stable when the US forces left? Could they have avoided the situation that have relied on a pragmatic alternate strategy? Earlier this year, a 12-page report released by Pentagon justified President Biden's role in the withdrawal decision. The report said that the president took the advice of military commanders on the tactical decisions about the operational retrograde of U.S. forces from Afghanistan, including the dates they closed facilities. The Republicans have time and again alleged that the Biden administration was stonewalling investigations into what they refer to as a disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, which ended in a chaotic evacuation the Taliban took over and left thousands of Afghan allies behind. Michael McCall, chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee and a ranking member of the committee, Gregory Weldon Meeks have been investigating the withdrawal from Afghanistan for almost two years now. McCall has for months been seeking a dissent channel cable sent by U.S. diplomats in Afghanistan in July 2021 that allegedly warned top officials of the potential collapse of Kabul soon after the withdrawal of U.S. troops. The dissent channel is a medium through which foreign service officers and the other U.S. citizens employed by the United States Department of State and Agency for International Development in other countries are invited to express their dissent or constructive criticism against a U.S. government policy. It is now very clear that what the Biden administration did was a wrong decision. It was taken in haste and it was taken in a manner so as to ensure the complete takeover of the uh, Taliban uh, of uh, Afghanistan or at least that is what its impact was. The Afghan government and its supporters never even got a chance to fight. Now, this is something that is possibly in the cable that, that was sent by the US ambassador to the State Department and that is what the Republicans want to be made public. And what they are saying is the following, that now a couple of years have already elapsed since this incident has occurred. If this is so, what is the point in hiding it? And this is what Secretary Blinken refuses to expose because they believe, it is pretty clear, that the wrong decisions of the present administration with respect to Afghanistan become very clear. Although public access to dissent channel cable can bring some significant revelations around the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The chaos and destruction that ensued in Afghanistan cannot be undone. The West seems to have washed its hands of the situation. The women in Afghanistan are banned to work at offices and girls are barred from schools and educational institutions. A humanitarian crisis of unimaginable proportions has grappled Afghanistan after Taliban took over the nation. According to World Food Programme, 19.9 million people in Afghanistan are facing acute food insecurity. 
Now that the Taliban has come back to power, they are doing exactly the same things that they were doing earlier. And the fact remains that uh, the Taliban is not necessarily known for its good governance. So, uh, uh, sectors like agriculture which have to be developed, Tal Taliban is not being able to do anything more than the, what the previous governments did. In fact, they are being, in a sense, degraded. So, you have bad administration and as a result of that bad administration and as a result also of uh, the Taliban government's isolation, they are neither able to grow food nor do they have the money to import food from abroad. The cash-strapped nation is seeking economic assistance from the international community. At this juncture, when the West has moved away, China is trying to exploit the situation. From investing in extraction of oil and mineral resources to extending China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC under its Belt and Road Initiative, China has further widened its debt trap for economically broken Taliban-ruled nation. China has long aspired to become a top player in the electric vehicle market, gaining access to Afghanistan's extensive and rich lithium deposits, estimated worth around 1 trillion US dollars, would be nothing short of a lottery for Beijing. According to the Kama Press, a Chinese company, Gochin, has expressed interest in investing 10 billion US dollars in Afghanistan's lithium deposits. The Chinese have one interest, a couple number of interests in Afghanistan. First is basically ta tali where the Afghans have certain mineral resources. There are enormous iron ore reserves in the Sanjak province. There are lithium reserves which are extremely important for electric vehicles and batteries. There is also some oil and some gas. Now, these oil and gas cannot be consumed by the Afghanistan, by the Afghans themselves, given the low nature of their economy. The state of their economy is such that they can't consume anything. So the Chinese have a vested interest in coming in. China's growing influence in Afghanistan could prove to be a major security concern for other South Asian countries. There has been a major shift in the geopolitical landscape in South Asia, ever since Afghanistan fell to Taliban. The diplomatic equations between the countries have also changed with respect to the Afghan nation. Although quite anticipated, the withdrawal of US troops has left the Afghan nation in the lurch. The big power in South Asia, India has to find a way around to stop China and Pakistan's influence in Afghanistan in the absence of the West. Moving on, several activists and members of Free Balochistan Movement and Balochistan National Movement held anti-Pakistan protests in European countries and across the globe to mark the 28th day as the day of mourning in Balochistan. The nuclear test conducted by Pakistan on this day in 1998 in Balochistan are still having its after effects. Residents in Balochistan have been suffering with radiations and several other terminal and congenital diseases for over last two decades. We have a report. On the occasion of May 28th, which is marked as Ashrok, the day of mourning in Balochistan, the members of Free Balochistan Movement and Balochistan National Movement held protests in many European and other countries across the globe. May 28, 1998 was the day when Pakistan conducted nuclear tests in Chagi, Balochistan that left residents to suffer from radiations and various other congenital diseases. The activists chanted slogans against Pakistan and termed its nuclear weapons anti-humanity and anti-peace. The protesters were carrying banners and placards with slogans highlighting the ill after effects of Pakistan's nuclear tests carried out in Balochistan. March 28, 1998, Pakistan faced at 6 nuclear bombs in the Chinese area of Balochistan, which leads to sarab detriment in the region. People are suffering from chronic diseases. Children are born with abnormalities 
that the cancers are more prominent in those areas due to the cooler radiation. From 28 May 1998 to the people of are from parking fetal diseases. And many people are getting affected. Livestock and agriculture have completely been destroyed. People are suffering from virus skin diseases before these nuclear tests. People ate enough meat of heavy work, but nuclear explosions have destroyed in all of me. It does not rain anymore in the areas of where it used. To end the area is turned to the barren land. Pakistan is the terrorist state. There were several protests held at many cities against the 1998 nuclear test carried out by Pakistan administration with support of their army. Thousands in the region are internally displaced, while several others have taken refuge in many European countries and across the world owing to continuous armed conflicts and Pakistan army's operations in Balochistan. The activists also chanted slogans for freedom of Balochistan from Pakistan. They believe that Pakistan army has taken away the basic human rights of ethnic residents of Balochistan. Pakistan के अपने जो पॉलिटिकल अथॉरिटीज हैं पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज हैं वो खुद अपने ही मीडिया पर कह चुके हैं कि बलूचिस्तान को पाकिस्तान का आर्मी कंट्रोल करता है बाप पार्टी को आप देख लें जब आर्मी ने छा उसको तोड़ा जब बनाया बलूचिस्तान की हुकूमत पाकिस्तान के अंडर है बलूचिस्तान एक कॉलोनी है Pakistan army has systematically carried out atrocities on the people, targeting individuals, especially journalists, students and political activists. They have been carrying out all forms of human rights violations to silence those who seek their rights and demand justice. Extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances and arrests by the Pakistan army are common occurrences in the region. Experts across the forum believe that Balochistan is one of the world's most violent conflict zones that continue to remain in the grip of Pakistani troops. Well, the shadow of terror continues to loom over the Kashmir Valley and those who are driven out by Islamic terrorists are in the line of fire once again. Since the start of the year, there have been series of targeted killings on people of minority community and unarmed policemen to create fear and paranoia. Recently, terrorist in Anantana killed Deepak Kumar, a Kashmiri Hindu who was working in a private circus at an amusement park. A report. Pakistan's sponsored terrorism is again on the rise in Kashmir, as the valley witnesses yet another targeted killing from a minority community. Kashmiri Hindus are once again getting dragged into the horror times of the 90s. On 29th May, yet another incident of targeted killing appeared in the Udhampur district of Jammu region. This time, the victim was Deepa Kumar, a worker at an amusement park in Anantnag. According to police officials, two motorcycle-borne youths fired three bullets at Kumar while he was on his way to a nearby market. He was immediately rushed to a nearby hospital where he succumbed to bullet injuries. According to media reports, Kashmiri freedom fighters in offshoot of Pakistan-sponsored terror group Jaish Muhammad claimed responsibility for the attack. हम लोग मजदूर आदमी हैं, दहाड़ी करते हैं, और माने हम लोग के गोली से हम लोग बहुत डर लगते हैं, बाहर का आदमी हैं। जब फायरिंग हुआ, तो हम लोग और डर गए। दो तीन फायरिंग आई आवाज, तो हम लोग डरने के बाद हम लोग गए नहीं। लास्ट में जब हम लोग गए, तो देखा है रोड पर देतबदी पड़ा है। Notably, this was not the first time that Kashmiri freedom fighters targeted a person from the minority community. Earlier in February, the group was involved in the killing of a Kashmiri Pandit who worked as a security guard in Achal village of Pulwama district. In January, terrorists killed four people of the Hindu community in the Dangri area of the Rajori district. According to official data, 29 people lost their lives in targeted killings 
which includes three Kashmiri Pandits, three other Hindus and eight non-local laborers in Jammu and Kashmir. This was indeed a desperate attempt by Pakistan to create an atmosphere of fear and terror among the people of Kashmir when the Union Territory has seen tremendous socio-economic growth after years. Experts believe that Pakistan is intentionally pushing terrorists into Kashmir with the aim to keep the valley on the boil. Meanwhile, hundreds of people of minority communities in Kashmir took to the streets demanding justice for the victim of terrorism, Deepak Kumar. Look, this is the call of an innocent killing of Deepu Kumar. We believe that one person is a human being, one person is a human being. One person is a innocent being. This is a cowardly thing. We say that a terror attack has happened. इस दीपू कुमार के ऊपर इसी की सॉलिडिटी में हम यहां पर हमने कैंडल मारिश निकाला। The neighboring country stands exposed. Pakistan, by its actions, has proven beyond doubt that it's a terrorist state. Pakistan's sponsor terrorists again want to reinstate fear in the minds of common Kashmiri minorities and other residents. However, such barbaric terror acts will not succeed in undermining Jammu and Kashmir's development journey as Indian security forces will not let this conspiracy succeed. Moving on, it has been nearly six months since Pakistan was excluded from the grey list of Financial Action Task Force FATF. But there has been no decline in the cross-border terrorism acts of Pakistan. We are now joined in by Amjad Ayub Mirza, a human rights activist from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir POK, to talk about this issue. Thanks so much for joining us. So, Mr. Mirza, Financial Action Task Force, on 21st October last year, excluded Pakistan from the grey list of the global watchdog on terror financing and money laundering. Do you think Pakistan has taken any action against terrorism since then? They have might have taken cosmetic uh, steps to show the world, but concrete steps are yet to be seen. I give you an example. Recently, there was a terrorist group by the name of Jamba's force that was launched in Pakistani occupied Jammu Kashmir under the watch of the Pakistan military in POJK. And uh, they started camping near the line of control in Punch. And uh, they announced that they're going to uh, attack uh, Sirinagar and Indian forces to uh, try to stop G20 from taking place, the session on tourism, tourism uh, working committee. So then we raised a lot of hue and cry and we talked about it and we uh, gave reports on it, we gave evidence on it and then the leader of uh, that uh, Jambas group Ghazi uh, Shahzad Ahmad was arrested. I don't think he was arrested. I think he was taken into protective custody because he got so much exposed that there was a danger that other competing jihadi groups might target him. So the military took him in protective custody. So uh, secondly, I mean, you can see that uh, jihadis are doing fundraising openly in Punjab and in POJK. They, it's not like uh, fundraising, like going from door to door. They have stalls in, in the middle of uh, like um, streets and uh, they openly fundraise. They have big fundraising meetings. They had one such meeting in Ravla Court and uh, where they try to uh, ask people to raise funds. I have got a whole list of people, how much each of them have uh, contributed. Uh, at least uh, I can confirm that uh, 1 million, close to 1 million, 900 and something thousand, close to 1 million rupees were raised just for the Jambas force to attack Kashmir. While the Pakistan-sponsored cross-border terrorism against India is still visible in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, do you think Pakistan is still running terrorist camps and launch pads in the POK region? Of course, not only POK, they are running them inside Afghanistan as well. I mean, their training, what happened is, 
when the, they had to get rid of this gray list and come into back into white list before that for three months they have been shifting uh, terrorist uh, organizations headquarters and camps to afghanistan into afghanistan near the borders where they have got influence in afghanistan and then they say oh you can send your observers there are no terrorist camps here excuse me terrorist camps have been shifted they're still being controlled from Quetta and from uh, Islam, uh, Rawalpindi, and, but they are not on the ground. The terrorist camps are there. The launching pads are there. I mean, they're terrorist camps and then they are launching pads. Launching pads are the second phase of this terror campaign. So first you do the recruitment, bring them into the terror training camps. Once they are trained, then they go to launching pads, which means that they are now ready to be launched for different terrorist activities inside uh, Union Territory Jammu Kashmir. So yes, terrorist camps are very much there, still there, and uh, they were never uh, abandoned. They were shifted. Well, Pakistan has become highly destabilized in the recent years. Its economy, the widespread famine in the country, militant attacks are high in the country. Do you think there has been a change in conscience of Pakistan army and administration in the country? When we look at Pakistan army or the civil bureaucracy, basically it's the civil bureaucracy that and the military establishment that jointly decide who are they going to bring into power as, a, as their civilian face? So in a broader context, to answer your question, no, uh, they haven't changed. They are still uh, following the same domestic policy of repression on the people, heavy taxation on their people to fill their own pockets and uh, enjoy their perks and privileges. And uh, as well as politically manipulate, political manipulation is going on. Well, thank you so much for the insights on the issue. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at ani.com. This is Lipak Shikurana signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.